why aren't SSDs getting bigger? Look, I I saw a four terabyte SSDs that were available at a not entirely unreasonable price in 2018. In the enterprise, there were 30 terabyte SSDs in 2018. It's 2023 and I don't have an 18 terabyte SSD available to me today that I can just jam in an M.2 slot. Well, I, I wanna know why. So I decided to reach out to Pure Storage, Justin Emerson, technical evangelist for Pure Storage. Thanks, Wendell. I pre appreciate you having me. And he is here to talk about enterprise flash storage because they work in enterprise storage and it's purely flash-based solutions. Uh, purely, I see what you did there. <laughs> so let's talk flash storage. <laughs> All things flash. Would you, would you say it's a fair assessment that people don't understand how flash works really? Cause it's overly complicated under the hood. It's like, I just, I just want to store my bits, but there's a lot going on. Yeah. People, people underestimate the complexity of what's actually happening under the covers with flash. You know, I, I remember, you know, I'm, I'm old enough to remember going into a BIOS and putting in the number of sectors and tracks in my hard drive. And that really neatly mapped onto where my bits were stored. And, and, and the reality of, of modern storage is absolutely nothing like that anymore. Yeah, that's even before my time. That is quite a quite a distance uh, in, into the past. But uh, what caught my eye was uh, Pure's got this Better Science blog, and it talks a little bit even about the physics of flash storage, which is interesting in its own right. But it turns out that bookkeeping and uh, some of the stuff in enterprise components is uh, part of the reason why it's difficult to manufacture large SSDs. The larger the SSD, the more stuff you have in flight, the more chance for something to go wrong with the stuff that's in flight if there's a bug or a problem. Yeah, that's right. So if we think about how flash works kind of under the covers, not getting into the quantum mechanics of it, which, which is pretty fascinating, but you know, when we talk about flash compared to a hard disk, a hard disk you can individually overwrite or, or write and read from a sector, you know, and then maybe that's 512 bytes in the, in the old days, 4K now in, in more modern spinning disks. But those were all sort of individually addressable. The scope of all three of those operations, reads, writes, and erase was the same. Flash isn't like that. Flash has a different scope for reads and then for writes, which are append only, and then there's erase blocks. And that completely messes with everybody's concept of how storage logically works in a system. And so uh, a flash solid state disk that plugs into an ordinary bus like a SAS or NVMe or any of those things um, is basically building all of this um, very critical infrastructure that represents what a hard drive would look like because that's how everything assumes it's talking to storage. And, and that complexity is really what's driving um, the the cost and the heat of these more uh, complex drives. So I, I heard you talk about, or I heard you mention erase blocks. And I was, you know, reading the blog and, and trying to put together uh, something that we could explain more simply to people. I mean, there's a computer on the SSD that is doing a lot of work. And when you talk about erase block, you know, walk walk me through the process there because the erase block thing is kind of at the heart of not just performance, because why is the drive faster when it's empty versus when it's full, but also when it's been used a few times. Right, so electrically, um, you know, flash memory is the ability to store a charge when the system is unpowered. That's what makes it non-volatile. That's why it's non-volatile memory. And when you, push a charge into this cell to store something, um, you can't just change that one cell at a time. You have to essentially release all of the electrons in a block at a time. And a block in, in, a, in a flash context can be many megabytes, tens of megabytes in size, whereas a single page, which is what we would you know, call the, the sort of the equivalent of a sector on a hard drive, an individual page is maybe kilobytes in size. So you can imagine an erase block is made up of hundreds or thousands of pages. And that's the scope at which you have to perform an erase. Now, the reason that Flash has an endurance is that the process of programming and erasing an entire block is one cycle. 
So you'll hear it called a program erase cycle or a PE cycle. And Flash in general has a finite number of those cycles that it can perform. After which it starts to lose its ability either to take that new charge, that new program, or um, the ability to essentially report back what that charge is reliably. Um, and so that's the, when we talk about flash endurance, that's the actual physics behind why flash has a particular lifespan. And that lifespan, the number of times you can do that actually decreases by almost an order of magnitude as you go from single level cells to multi-bit cells. And as you go along to even, you know, four bits per cell, it gets much more complicated to read and store data at that level of density. And that's why endurance goes down. So not, not only are we working with erase blocks that are potentially megabytes in size, but the erase block doesn't, it never really gets smaller. As the technology marches on with flash, the erase block, if anything, gets larger, not just because the density of the data increases, but also because it's physically more complicated on the chip. So if we're right. if we're working yeah. at an erase block that's megabytes and we have to juggle erasure and the erasure might not go right and then the mechanism has to say, oh, the cell's worn out, we need to put it somewhere else. That seems like that's a lot of bookkeeping to keep up with. Like how do you how do you manage all of that in flight? Because the operating system's not doing that. What's what's doing that under the hood? Right. To to the rest of the system, if you're looking at a at a solid state drive that plugs in using a, a normal interface, um the context that the uh, the software above it, the operating system, the computer, they just see a contiguous set of logical block addresses, which for all intents and purposes is, you know, the same way that we would map sectors and tracks onto one contiguous set of block addresses. And when you when you think about like from a bookkeeping standpoint, let's let's take that analogy a little bit further, right? An erase block is like an entire shelf of books. And you can put a book at a time up on the shelf, but when you want to clear the shelf, you have to clear the whole shelf. You can't pull a book out and, and put another book in. You can't do that one, one book at a time. And so you end up in these situations where if you're trying to sort of maintain this illusion that this is just a contiguous set of logical block addresses, you end up taking books off of one shelf and then just putting them on an empty shelf and then moving all the books you want to keep, putting them on that same empty shelf so that you can erase or wipe the whole shelf. <laughs> so and, you, you end up with uh, lots of duplicate copies of the book and then it's like, which book was the latest book that I needed to refer to? Exactly. And so you can imagine that, you know, if you if you have essentially the world's largest library ever, um, because you're talking about, you know, uh, billions of books, um, you start to run into very complicated mapping and tracking problems to figure out what logical bits live on what physical page. <laughs> yeah. That is what the flash translation layer, the FTL, if, if you've ever heard of that, that's what that actually is. It's how do I map what's really going on under the covers with electrical charges and bits and bytes? And how do I map that to the data that I'm actually trying to store and read back because the physical mapping of you know block addresses to a particular spot on a spinning platter, um, even in the hard drive case, that really hasn't been 100% true. And certainly once you get into volume managers and stuff, it gets even more complicated. But like with Flash, every SSD is a computer, like you said, but more specifically, it's a storage array. Every little SSD is really its own tiny storage array, and it does redundancy, and it does data placement, and all these things. Um, so it's an incredibly complicated device, and to, that's not to say that they're, you know, they're not incredible. They are. They're really incredible. But the job that they're doing um, is almost is almost impossible to please everybody because you kind of have to deal with all the data that somebody could possibly throw at you, and you just have to do your best with it. Yeah, and you know. When we sort of started this conversation, we were thinking about the context of 18 terabytes in an enterprise storage device versus your typical M.2. You can look at a, at a you know, a typical M.2. I mean, even a high end one, even a nice one that's like four or eight terabytes. There's only three or four microchips on there. So it's like, well, okay, like say two of the chips contain storage. One of them's for computation. I think there's a DRAM chip on there. And so 
okay, there's two chips for storage, but we're talking, you know, it doesn't erase the entire chip when it has to deal with something. So there's millions of pages on each one of those chips that have to be juggled in this way. And you could get in a situation where one chip, like something migrates from one chip to another just because you need to make one tiny little change. Um, and the operating system has no idea this is happening. So I'm, you know, I'm trying to think about how we can describe it in terms of, like you get a game installed, you know, Doom Eternal or whatever, and you're editing, you know, your homework for Econ 101, and you save your little 64 kilobyte document. It may have to rewrite Doom Eternal the same way that you're talking about with the bookshelf thing. It may yeah. be rewriting megabytes of, of a game just because that happened to be in a cell that needed to mm -hmm. uh, needed to be rewritten. And the operating system has no idea of that. And, and while that's happening, there's a performance anomaly that happens if you ha if you go to access that. that. That's one of the reasons why um, in the very early days of solid state disks, the trim command, which didn't exist prior to SSDs, became so critical because up until that point, if you had the spinning disk and there was stale data on it that the computer knew wasn't the current data anymore, it didn't actually matter. Like the, it didn't matter that the data was sitting on the drive um, because the computer, the, the higher level computer, the one you're interacting with, um, just deallocated and said, it's not important because the hard drive under the covers isn't moving a bunch of data around. But once you start having a system where it cares about how much free space there is because it needs to use that to move books around, move move bits of data around. Now it really matters for the SSD to understand, is this data actually important or can I erase it? Um, because if your operating system, your, your, your file system never actually deallocates um, data to the underlying storage, it never trims that storage, the SSD just fills up to 100% and then stays there forever which, as you pointed out in the beginning, is its worst performance case. Uh, you know, a full SSD has the worst performance because it has the least margin of error, the least um, working space, the least over provision space. Yeah, the idea of over provisioning is another thing that factors in here. I'm sure that a lot of people watching this video have heard the term over provisioning, but you know, really, what does that that mean in this context? Is is it just unused space that? you know they they sell you a one terabyte drive but it's actually slightly bigger to try to deal with some of this that that's absolutely the case so most solid state disks will contain if you if you look at the chips and then you look at the data sheet for the chips and you figure out how many gigabits or terabits of flash that chip is then you do the math you start to figure out that there's actually more storage here than i can see when I format my drive. And this is not some like format overhead or terabytes to tibby bytes conversion nonsense. This is, this is actually that there's there's more bits that you could store there, but they're not made all available to you at once. And that's not for nefarious purposes. It's because they need that extra storage in order to move data around. So we've moved from triple level cells to four level cells in the in the last couple of generations. And when PCI Express 4 storage, like the transition from PCI Express Gen 3 to Gen 4 first happened, it's like, oh, Gen 4 drives, they're so much faster. It was really stream performance and not latency. Those are two important components of storage, I guess. But now we're moving from triple level cells, which is what was kind of in vogue then, to four level cells and even five level cells, which have an even lower endurance. Um, a lot of drives do publish their endurance specifications, like how many terabytes can you write to this disk? And enterprise drives are a lot better because there's physically a lot more chips there for, to deal with this, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, but it seems like it, it's just, it's way, way more complicated. I mean, you would think a mechanical hard drive, it's got a, it's moving things physically on the inside. And what we're describing is insanely way more complicated, but because there's no moving parts, the insanely way more complicated thing is faster than the mechanical thing. That just, ah, it's, it's a counterintuitive. Electrical things tend to be faster than mechanical things. Just yeah. sort of, um, the, I, I was in a, a meeting earlier today and our, our founder cause said, you know, the things that break in a data center are things that spin, whether that's, you know, a, a, a disc or a fan or things that wiggle. <laughs> <laughs> cable, et cetera, right? If stuff that doesn't move tends not to break. Um, and so if you if you think about like the flash density getting higher, like yeah, the buses are getting faster, but the the counterintuitive thing is is that as flash gets denser, it gets effectively slower. And that's because if you, if you understand how 
the flash is getting denser, what's actually happening, it, it makes all the sense in the world. A flash cell stores a charge, right? And that charge is an analog signal. It's like a particular voltage level. And you can measure it 10 times and get 10 slightly different numbers because, you know, physics and cosmic rays and the magnetic field that you're sitting in, like all of these things are, in, all of these things are entirely um, uh, variable. And so when you have a cell that you're storing multiple bits in, it's not that there's like a little chamber that you store each of the bits in. Okay. What you're actually doing is storing more potential voltage levels. So a single level cell has a charge or it doesn't, let's say a high charge and a low charge. And that's a zero or a one. But when you want to store two bits, you have to store, you have to, you have to measure four possible voltage states. Yeah. So is no electrons, a few electrons, some electrons, or a lot of electrons. And that is a hard problem. Now imagine doing that with eight different voltage levels. I think the... Uh... And, and the precision at every, you know, set of, um, of number of bits increases by doubling. So getting one more bit requires double the number of states, which means that the problem of discriminating between these different voltage levels, which again, are kind of like reading an analog signal, um, gets, you know, exponentially more difficult. It goes up with the square of the number of bits. And so when you think about, well, if I'm using the cell, it gets more difficult to read, it gets less consistent, et cetera, then you understand why it has fewer program erase cycles because you need a much higher level of precision to reliably store more bits. And as that precision wears, then it becomes even more difficult to actually get the data back that you were expecting. It's worn out and then we make a note, don't use, don't use this anymore. And then the bookkeeping comes about. Well, yeah. another it's kind of tangentially related to this is people notice it's like hey there's a there's a dram chip on my on on my ssd and a lot of people on our forum think that that's used for some type of caching or some type of mechanism to prevent the slowdown but that's not really it at all can can you walk us through you know how dram is typically used on a on a on a self-contained sort of nand device yeah i think in the case of a consumer drive there are probably instances where that dram is sort of in the data path because in a consumer drive, you may not have like power protection. Like if, if the power goes out, oh well, the data was in flight is gone. And that's, you know, what you're expecting out of a consumer level drive. But let's talk about this in like the enterprise case. Um, if you're using a, an enterprise drive with power protection, generally speaking, the DRAM on, on your SSD is going to be there to store all of that metadata, all of that flash translation layer. And anything that you want to keep around is probably stored in a very small buffer. And that buffer needs to be small enough that you can flush it to something non-volatile if you lose power. Um, so that sort of um, defines the maximum size of any buffer you can have is how much uh, electricity you have left over <laughs> in order to eventually write it to, to NAND when you, when you lose power. The drive and knows so, it's not got power, but it also knows it's got a millisecond left that it can do something useful. Exactly. Right. And so you'll see drives with supercapacitors or other things like that in order to, to give you that, that, that time buffer to, to, to write things down. If there's a, if there's power failure, what most of the NAND is actually used for is for keeping that entire metadata mapping table in a very fast medium because getting to the data is a much more difficult problem at scale than reading the data. It's figuring out which page on which block on which channel on which die on which channel I need to go to to get this bit. That mapping problem is a really complex problem, and it's what um, requires the speed of DRAM. It's the same reason why when you're using other you know like file systems like you've talked about in the past, um, where you'll have a cache of that metadata table um, on faster media or in memory specifically because that's the part that's the most latency sensitive mm -hmm. and so having that in DRAM um, 
is a huge enabler for performance. Otherwise, you know, you're you're, you're essentially um, going to your your read times are going to be really, really slow from a latency standpoint. Yeah. So metadata in this context is is then what you're saying is, I think, is um, it doesn't really refer to any real user data at all. It's just the the bookkeeping that the thing is doing internally to know where the most recent copy is, because otherwise you could get yourself into trouble if that's not uh, kept up with. Like if the drive loses power just the wrong time after you save your document file, it's like not only have you, it's like you lose your document file, but chunks of other things are potentially corrupted as well because it was in the middle of a program erase cycle or it was trying to program another cell and it had already updated the metadata or something like that. Yeah, there's metadata at every single level of the stack. You have metadata in sort of the, the, the drive itself, which is where did I store what? You have metadata probably at the, the higher level file system, which is what are the files and what folders do they live in? What are the attributes that they have? And then you may have metadata in the application that uses them, which is like, what kind of file is this? What is it an image? What's what's its resolution? All these things are metadata, but they're depending on the context and the stack you're looking at, it's, it's a very different kind of data. In the case of a, of a solid state disk, or you know, an enterprise storage array, that metadata is where is this data? Uh, maybe there's multiple copies of that data. Maybe there's multiple points in time copies of that data. Um, and knowing where all of that is and keeping track of it all is the number one job of a storage system. Um, because if you don't know where the data is, you can't go find it. Uh, so I think people have probably also heard of the idea, the concept of uh, bad sectors. And we sort of touched on it a little bit about, uh, you know, there's some area that's reserved on the disk and you know, you sort of eat into that after a while. Some, you get some stats from that, I think from smart reporting, some drives expose that on smart reporting to be like, I've used 4% of the reserve area. I've used 9% of the reserve area, but this whole concept of bad sectors, at least as they're exposed to the operating system goes out the window. Cause the operating system doesn't like the bad sector thing. There is a vestige from mechanical storage and right to have any real insight into this, you'd have to use something like smart. And so it's just computer to computer dialogue there. Or, you know, how do you know if your flash drive is, is working correctly or performing like it should, you, you, you know, it doesn't even sound like speed is even guaranteed. That, I mean, that's true, on a, especially on a consumer drive, you know, as, as you've um, shown in some of your other videos, like you can write to a drive and at a certain point, a, a particular buffer runs out and then suddenly the performance drops because you're seeing what the performance of the drive actually is um, instead of it being this like short term buffer. But, you know, for a lot of home use cases or, or consumer use cases, that's perfectly fine because that fits the use case very well. Um, if you think about like, you know, bad sectors is absolutely sort of a, well, there's a physical thing problem with there's like a scratch on this platter. So I'm just not going to touch those things and I'm going to remap them somewhere else. And that's actually a really simple like mapping problem because it's just to keep a list of which things actually ended up where. <laughs> this um, film that are the sector. Yeah. yeah, it's an exception list as opposed to a map. And um, but once you get into, you know, SSDs that I mean, in the consumer space, you already have like a where percentage. So some some drives will report, you know, you, you know, you mentioned that they're um, they publish a, a number of write cycles or, or a number of drive writes per day or a number of total, total drive writes that they'll support. And they'll give you like a, how close are you from a percentage standpoint to the life of this, of this drive. Where it gets really complicated is where you get into what if you have an array of many drives? Uh. How, how do you then figure that out? On a on a massive scale. Now, maybe that's easier if the drives are physically in your in your computer and you're running software RAID and you can look in the operating system and it can still individually talk to your drives. But what if this is a massive storage array? What if this is a storage array of tens or hundreds of SSDs? Yeah. How, how, how do you even tell? How do I'll, you know? I'll sort of confess. This is part of the reason why Pure Storage was was sort of an interesting like. Let's reach out and talk to them because. This is what you're doing at scale. I mean, you know, when we talk about enterprise storage, it's like I'm I'm playing with ZFS, I'm obsessing with ZFS, and I've been in the bowels of ZFS. I've 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 seen things. But knowing how Flash works at the small scale, it's like well, there's a lot of redundancy and stuff that could go away here. And then I found out how your uh, or how pure storage works at a macroscopic level was really interesting because you move a lot of that stuff up the chain. It's not the individual controllers on flash in large part, you're dealing directly with the actual flash chips 
and you're dealing with the, those maps a lot more macroscopically. Exactly. And I think when I mentioned earlier that every solid state disk is kind of its own little storage array, um, that that observation was one of the things that sort of informs how we build our systems, which is, does it make sense to build a storage array on top of a bunch of other storage arrays? Or does it make sense to build one storage array that looks at the whole problem holistically, which is our approach to um, how we build large scale flash systems. So we talked about how, you know, an SSD has this flash translation layer and there's DRAM and that DRAM stores where everything maps to. Um, but if you think about it, that's the exact same problem that a storage array one level up the stack does. It says, I've got a whole bunch of drives and each of these drives stores little bits of data and I have redundancy so I can lose a drive, but I've got to keep track of where all the data is. I have to keep track of which versions of the data it is if I want to provide enterprise features like snapshots or um, you know metadata uh, information about other things or like what are the hot blocks, what are the cold blocks. All of that kind of stuff is the same thing that an SSD is doing but every SSD is doing it sort of on an island. And then you build some higher level of abstraction above that to wrangle all of that together. So, so what you end up having is a whole bunch of SSDs each doing this operation in an island and then a storage array on top of it, trying to you know, coordinate all of those things. But each of those things is a black box. So the, the way we approach the problem, since we're pure storage and we only use uh, flash, we're purely, purely flash, we build systems in a different way where instead of using what is essentially a, a, a disk made of flash that's pretending to be a hard drive, we build our own drives. And they're not a drive that you can just plug into an ordinary system. So th this right here, this is what we call a direct flash module. And this one is 48 terabytes. And what you can see hopefully is that really it's just a board full of, of NAND chips. There's not a lot of other things on there. And that's because what we've done is we've taken all of that um, complex NAND geometry and management and, and all these other things, garbage collection, and we've moved that up to the system level. If you think about it, the storage system itself is doing garbage collection because it's got to go through and it's got to delete data that the user deleted. The drive is doing garbage collection. It's got to delete data that the storage system deleted. Why not garbage collect once? Why not store one map rather than store a map to a whole bunch of smaller maps? And that's really the concept behind direct flash, which is we don't talk to flash like it's a, a pretending to be a hard disk. We talk to it natively. And what people may not realize is that NVMe as a protocol actually has very little to do with flash. NVMe is, is really about the bus. It's about the way you talk to the, the media. Case in point, there uh, at um, a conference a couple years ago, um, they showed off, someone showed off a NVMe attached spinning disc. <laughs> <laughs> it's a thing. And you would say, well, why? And it's because it's actually easier to attach a whole bunch of 1X PCIe lanes uh, directly to a CPU than it is to build a bunch of SAS and SATA controllers to do it for you. So um, again, NVMe as a protocol is just, a different way um, of uh, a different transport, but it's not really a totally different way of talking to the drive. You're still talking about logical block addresses. There's some commands and stuff that sort of make more sense in a flash context, but you still are abstracting away all of the complexity under the covers of the underlying NAND. And so that's a very different approach that we take as, as far as I know from, from anybody else in the industry. Yeah, well, there's enough, it's, it sounds really good, but for me, the thing that crystallized my encounter with, oh, there's something that's catastrophically not great here when, when things are at scale, uh, was uh, putting a whole bunch of NVMe storage in a Threadripper-based system where, you know, I've got the memory bandwidth, I've got the I.O. bandwidth, I've got the PCIe 4 lanes, everything is great here, but the latencies kind of stack in that sort of a raid based solution. And so even though I'm running, you know, a four or an eight or a 16 drive raid solution, uh, 
the combined latency of stacking all of that and then moving things into memory and you know this nvme storage additively is a significant percentage of the bandwidth of main memory that wasn't true with mechanical storage mechanical storage was so much slower that if you could write a whole bunch of it together it's like goodness gracious this is so much faster and that was one of the first things that i noticed in you know pure storage some of your benchmarks your iops the number of io operations you can do in a unit time is is off the scale and it's like that can't be right there's got to be some kind of shenanigans shenanigans going on and usually how a storage provider does that is they just do it all from dram and it's all reads and it's like yeah there's no there's no danger if you've just got tons of dram read because but that's not what you're doing you're you're putting the io much closer to the flash taking out that middle layer and it's a twofold benefit you get an a decrease in latency because there's less chains or less links in the chain all the way to the memory and then the second thing is that it's not just reads like not not only do you benefit from the dram cache you have more dram cache that's less duplication because in the other solution you've got the dram cache in the system as well as the metadata cache in the device and then it's like well you could just move all of that memory and you cache you can cache both the data for reads and the metadata all in one and it's like oh, okay now it makes sense why the latency can possibly be so low is architecturally it's different and home labbers will have already experienced that themselves it's like my my four-way nvme raid zero is not it's not it's a little disappointing if i'm honest but it's like oh well, architecturally it makes sense yeah i think you know when you when you think about let, let, let's use your, your your zfx your zfs uh, example right you have a, a file system which well, file system plus volume manager plus a bunch of other things. It's insane it's overhead. <laughs> yeah, but 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 it was also fundamentally designed around spinning disk. Um, you know, it was a it was an entire architecture that was designed. And you can read the original ZFS papers and, and understand about all of the ways that it works. You know, one of the big credits to the entire ZFS team is that they were very, you know, open and public about how it all works, and it's why it's still an active developing project today. But the the constraints that it was designed under were similar to most of the other file systems that came out of that era which was how do i take a whole bunch of very slow spinning disks and how do i optimize around avoiding seek times um how do i optimize writing where the head is right now instead of seeking to somewhere else so that i can write something um it was all about optimizing around seek time um and so write buffers, right? The intent log, and then flushing that intent log, and then doing this batch update of all of the, the index trees and everything like that. Those were all functions that were designed around how do I make hard drives go fast? And those constraints, those, you know, design criteria completely change with NAND flash, which has effectively no seek time. Um, at least from an electrical standpoint, right? you still have to find where the stuff is, but there's no head that physically has to move across a spinning platter. Um, but instead, now you have a media with a finite endurance. And so what we should be doing is building systems around writing the least amount of data physically for the most amount of logical data. That's the biggest constraint we have, aside from keeping track of where everything is. Our constraint is not really... Um, you know, how do I avoid a disk seek? And so not only from a media level, like what we try and do is remove layers of indirection, remove um, these kinds of, uh, you know, interface layers so that we can get a more direct um, Save on interface. latency. <laughs> right, it saves on latency, but it also reduces the amount of write times we have to write to the NAND because we can understand the context of what's going on in each direct flash module. We know where all the bits are laid out. We know what that underlying sort of flash geometry looks like. And so when we write data, we write it with that context in mind, which lets us do much more intelligent, clever you know, things with the underlying media. Um, one of my favorite anecdotes is, um, you know, a normal SSD or, or a hard drive or any other storage, you know, device, when you go to it and say, give me this data, you expect that data back. And if it doesn't respond with that data, um, you tend to have a bad time. You know, 
warnings come up, you get things in your event log, things in your things in D message, it's, you're, you're not happy. Or not, depending on the brand of enterprise storage solution you're using. Yeah, and so <laughs> so what we what we do is let's say that a drive is in the middle of a program array cycle, which could take tens of milliseconds. Well, we'll go to the drive, we'll, we'll, we'll look where the data is, we'll say, oh, this drive is busy. And rather than just waiting for that operation to complete, it's actually faster to rebuild that data from the drives that aren't busy, either using you know parity or erasure coding, what have you, um, and then return that. So we actually have drives, which if they're busy, we know they're always a part of a larger system with data resiliency already built in. And so we'll actually leverage that fact to improve performance because rather than waiting 20 milliseconds for this program erase cycle to finish before I can get my bits, because I can only do one at a time per channel, let's just reconstruct it from parity and return it to the user because that's actually faster. Because again, reads are close to free um, when you're talking about flash, it's really the, the rights that are the constraint. That's a really uh, powerful thing to be able to leverage with this kind of a, I don't want to call it a distributed architecture, but you really are uh, distributing the resiliency in a way that would otherwise be impossible. Right. Yeah. If you if you look at if you look at something like this and you plug it into uh, you know an ordinary system, if you figure out if you figure out how to to wire it up, right, you're not going to see you know, oh, here's where I put my partition table and here's how I format it with my file system because it, it just fundamentally isn't that. Um, we don't build drives that have to work in everything. We build modules that work in our system. So we don't, we don't you know, sell these as something that you can put in your desktop computer, but we sell a system that they go into and they're designed with that in mind. So we, what we try and do is build hardware and software together um, in a very intentional way so that we can get the most out of it and we can optimize um, the best way. Because while a single solid state disk in isolation works phenomenally, the problems that you run into at scale are ones that are sort of intractable until a massive change in how the industry um, interfaces with Flash um, um, until something like that comes around. And there have been plenty of attempts to, to do that. You can read all of the alternative NVMe specs and look into some of the other like hyperscaler level initiatives that have been going on. But we've been doing this for close to 10 years. Um, and it's a really hard problem. Uh, and we have a lot of really, really smart engineers working on this problem. Um, and it, it's something that we try and, and make um, completely transparent and effortless to the user of the system. But, you know, part of the thing, part of the reason I, I really love um, talking about this stuff is because I find what, what happens under the covers so fascinating and so interesting. And before one of the FANG companies wants to just buy you wholesale. <laughs> well, I mean, I can see why Pure Storage is considered the leader with this and, you know, 10 years going because you're so far ahead of the curve for the software and the hardware stack and, and understanding the, the moving parts of this. When when we were discussing this video before, uh, you know, I, I kind of had, I, it, the more that you talked about the architecture and the more it is like, no, this is how we do this. This is how we're getting the, the performance numbers that you're seeing. There's not really, you know, any cheating or anything going on here. I like that the product can, it's not, I don't want to say that it's so complicated. You have these posts about like, let's go back to basics about how flash works. But I get that that's really where you got to start to explain this because everybody thinks about every this kind of stuff in these abstractions that do not apply anymore. It's like I've explained, you know, uh, magnets in terms of rubber bands. And it's like, well, that's a special kind of failure right there because you've made it more complicated than the actual physical phenomena you're trying to describe. And that's what is that's how things have happened with flash storage and it's really super frustrating but the blog posts uh, everybody should check out the blog posts on on your blog um about the physics of flash memory but also up through the stuff that we've talked about because it really is interesting it's more interesting than than most people realize and uh i really hope that uh in the next video we get to talk about you know b trees versus lsm trees and, and where that goes because philosophically there's some connections there to zfs but you guys really are about 10 years ahead well i i'm 
really appreciate it. Um, I, I find this stuff fascinating. I hope your viewers uh, find it really interesting too. Hopefully you all understand a little bit more about what's going on under the covers, inside your, your home PC, inside your laptop, inside your phone, inside pretty much everything that powers modern computing. Um, Flash is really, really incredible stuff. And you know we based our whole company around the idea of Flash is going to completely change the entire storage landscape. And to your point, we need to go back to first principles and think about how we build storage because when there's a change this disruptive um just trying to you know build a house on a foundation that was meant for something entirely different usually doesn't end up being the smartest approach yeah. um it may not it may be the easy way but the whole idea behind better science is that we're trying to do things the right way the logical way not just the easy way and, and that takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of work. And it's a credit to all the really amazing people that work here. Nice. Well, thank you very much for joining me. I really appreciate it. And here's the next one.